you go down the pad, let me make an announcement um, about the fri uh, Friday's quiz. I guess at, at, at one point last, year, last week, I think I, I've announced, but I don't think anyone paid any attention. Anyway, we didn't put it on the web website, so that means it's not official. Um, that we're going to have the quiz like, uh, I think I said something like 6 in the morning. or I, But anyway. Um, but the, the TAs have, uh, have prevailed, and they say, no, 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 we can't do that. Um, and so uh, the quiz on fr Friday, here, I'm, I'm just simply going to make a plea. And the plea is, uh, please come either at 9 AM or at 9.40, OK? Not 9.10. Not 9.25, not 9.33. So this is my plea for those. Now, I suspect this is going to do no good because um, I strongly suspect that the people who come at 9.25 don't watch the tapes. So if you know anyone or you know what they are, and I, I mean, I suspect they're all sleeping. Don't, don't you imagine? That's what a normal person would be doing right now. But um, and if any of you know any of them or see them sometime, um, Maybe you could just pass the word along. So this is, uh, that's the idea. All right. And we'll see how this works. OK. Back to um, sinusoidal steady state. So the, the basic result is this. If a convolution system is stable, meaning that its impulse response falls off with time, which means a lot of things. For example, uh, it means in the time domain, the interpretation is that the, the system has a fading memory that the output is mostly dependent on the recent past and less and less dependent on the remote past input. In that case, if you put in a signal which is sinusoidal, then um, the, the output is asymptotically sinusoidal. It's got the same frequency. And magnitude and phase are determined, in fact, given precisely by the frequency <coughs> response, which is the transfer function evaluated at s equals j omega. Okay. So that's the idea. This, you can use this two ways. Uh, this gives you an interpretation of when you see a transfer function. Up till now, for example, the transfer function 1 over s plus 1 simply means to you an impulse response of e to the minus. It means in the time domain, it's a system which convolves something with the function e to the minus t. Now it means something different. It means 1 over j omega plus 1 tells you the amplitude, the, a, the, the amplitude and phase of the asymptotic sinusoidal response of the system. OK, so that's the I idea. Um, and as a, as a simple example, which I think we looked at last time, here's a, a 1 over s plus 1 filter. And the input here is simply cosine t. That's given by the dashed curve here. Okay? What comes out is not sinusoidal. That's very, that cannot be emphasized enough. In other words, this, this uh, solid line plot is not sinusoidal. The correct statement about this solid line plot is it is asymptotically sinusoidal, that within, in fact, about 5 or 10 seconds, it has converged to a sinusoid. The sinusoid it converges to, we can talk about its amplitude and phase. Its amplitude is precisely 1 over root 2 or 0 0.707 times this. And its phase is 45 degrees lagging behind the driving signal here. So this is what it looks like. It looks like that. And in fact, you can check that that's, that's pretty much what we have here, that, that, is a, that that's a quarter of a cycle and so on. So that, that's the idea. That's what it looks like. OK. Um, so this, this idea is used and has been used for quite a while in a, in a lot of uh, different ways. One. Uh, whole area it's widely used is measuring frequency response. Okay? So the basic idea in measuring frequency response, this is something that goes back uh, basically 100 years or so, is you pick a bunch of frequencies, you apply a sinusoid to your system at a certain frequency and with a certain uh, phase and amplitude. Then what you do is you wait for the output to approach sinusoidal steady state. Once it's approached sinusoidal, when it is in sinusoidal steady state, meaning the transient has decayed, you simply measure the magnitude and phase of, of, this, uh, of this output. And then if you're doing this by hand, what might happen is you might do a few tens or just 10, 10 points. It depends what you're doing here. For example, you might have modeled a circuit, and you might want to simply take enough frequency response measurements to check the transfer function that you think is correct. Then you might just check this at a few. 
On the other hand, if this is being done by, uh, by computer, in other words, it's automated testing, then there'd be no reason not to do sinusoidal steady state testing at uh, several thousand or 10,000 frequencies. And the idea is simply to, to you just simply store this. And what you would get is a, is a, uh, a list of measured values of the uh, frequency response. So that's sort of uh, the idea. This is used very widely. Um, it's, used in, uh, it, it's used in mechanics. It's used in electromechanics. It's used in electrical systems. Um, for, uh, I'll give you a specific example is if you take something like an audio power amplifier, which I mean everybody here knows a little bit about. Um, here, specifications are actually given in terms of frequency response. And you, you've probably seen things that say plus minus 0.5 decibels, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. This is precisely what they're, what's, what's being talked about. Um, it's far rarer uh, to have, in fact, it is likely that in most cases you could call up and you could ask someone, and don't do this at Fry's, for example. But you could say, oh, I'd be, do you mind, could I see the step response of the amplifier? Now, if you actually talk to people who design amplifiers, they will be more than delighted to talk about step responses with you or impulse response of a power amplifier. Um, but as I say, don't try that at Fry's. Um, OK, so um, it's widely done, widely, w widely used, um, and in fact, even if you've done a lot, uh, some modeling uh, with transfer functions from some other way by taking circuit models and all that sort of stuff, um, responsible engineering usually demands that at some point someone show you some real measured data. And in fact, a very comforting plot to see is something, this is in all fields, a very, very comforting plot is to see something that shows, for example, the magnitude of the frequency response and someone would show you something that looks like, like that. And you'd say, that's according, this is the frequency response according to my model. In other words, my analytical model of it. And then people might show, you might see some things that look like this, right? Or, or you might see a different plot that kind of looks like, like that. And this would be measured, and this would be predicted. OK? And this would be a, a plot like this across many fields would be taken as a sign of responsible engineering. It means that this circuit that you assumed and then analyzed the, the transfer function and plugged in S equals J omega actually is not too far from what was actually measured in a laboratory. So this would be the type of plot. And so you'd see this universally in many, many, many fields. You'd see this type of plot. Even if you have no intention of using the frequency response for design, you would use it just for verification. That's very common. OK. So. Our next topic is plotting frequency response. Um, and there's lots of ways to do that. It depends on what the purpose is, and there's, there's many different ways. Um, although one is, one is dominant, although it's for a particular uh, purpose. Um, so here are some ways you can do it. Basically, you're plotting a complex a function which accepts as argument a real number, frequency, a, a non-negative real number, and returns a complex number, which is this frequency response. That's h of j omega. So for example, you could plot uh, real and imaginary parts as functions of omega. So someone might show you a plot. And there, in fact, are many, many fields where you would do this. The real part might look like this. This would be the real part. This would be omega. And this would be the imaginary part, something like that. OK? And in fact, that's a. Uh, that's a common, that's a not uncommon uh, form of plot. Now, another thing you can do is you can actually plot um, the, actually simply the complex number in the complex plane as a curve with omega as a frequency. And I'll show you an example of one of those in a minute. Or you can plot, and the most common plot is to plot the magnitude and the phase of the frequency response as a function of omega. And that's on a logarithmic frequency scale. So let's look at some pictures here. Um, here's, a, here's our su vehicle suspension system with m equals 1, b equals 0.5. It's, it's one where I think early, you know, in the previous lecture we looked at that. This is the one that's a bit under damp. So when you go over a curve, you get at least, you go over a, a curb, you get at least a couple of cycles of oscillation. OK? So that's, as I recall, you can look back and see what it looks like. OK. Um, here's the transfer function. The frequency response is, is this thing when I plug in s equals j omega. Now, actually going from this to this, I had to do some arithmetic, of course, uh, complex arithmetic. It's just complex arithmetic I did to go from here to here. 
I plugged S equals J omega in. Everything is complex, so I kind of collected things together and I made that real and, and I, I think this is the right. I think this is right, but I don't guarantee it. I would say, I would say that this expression has a probability of being correct only about 0.8. So since I did it, I did it once and maybe checked it once. So, uh, but that's it. It's, it's, it's actually quite complicated. Um, in fact, this is a whole lot easier to understand than this. I think everyone here looks at this and understands pretty quickly what it is. You look at it and you say, well, the denominator is quadratic. Depends on the roots. You might even start to get a sense for when b squared is less than 4ac or not. But of course, you can always just take b squared and compare it to 4ac, and it's considerably less, underdamped, so on and so forth. Okay? Um, that's a lot harder to understand from this. So here are some, here are some plots. Here's a so-called Nyquist plot of this. And what it does is it, um, it starts off, you plug in omega equals 0. That's s equals 0. The dc gain is 1 here. So we'll find that here, here. There you go. There's 1. That's the point 1, 1 plus j0. Then as omega increases, I believe this is omega increasing. That's omega equals 0. This is omega small. At some point, uh, at some point it goes all the way out over to here. Then it kind of twists around over here and so on. And then it goes back to 0. That's 0 there. That's for infinite high frequencies. This is actually showing you the plot. This is for negative omega here. Okay? And that, that's the curve. This curve, of course, doesn't mean anything to you other than it being, being a pretty plot right now. Um, but in fact, I can promise you all that it will make uh, some sense to you later. Not in this class, actually, but in, a, in another one. There's a question? Mm -hmm. The unit here, this is imaginary, and this is real. So it's just the units of h. Yeah, so let, let's, just, let's just eyeball a point. Let's plug in omega. No, it's too, actually, it's too complicated. Let's take omega equals 1. Okay? When omega equals 1, s squared is j omega squared is minus 1, and that cancels that. So let, let's just, let's just, let's just check, check one point, h of j. h of j is equal to 0.5j plus 1 divided by, that's j squared. That cancels that guy, 0.5j. And what's that? Oh, I don't know. Let's see. It's 1 minus 2j. Is that the same reason? Did I do that right? OK, so we're just doing one point is 1 minus 2j. So let's go to this plot and find out where that ended up. I hope it's here. <coughs> well, let's find out. Uh, let's see, 1 minus 2j. Did I, do that right? did I do it right or did I do it wrong? Anybody see 1 minus 2j here somewhere? That's right here. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. OK, so this, we can now label this point. That's omega equals 1, OK? So we're OK. And then this, this is uh, omega equals minus 1. OK? So, so, I mean, the hope is that the plot is actually correct here. I suspect it is. OK. Now, the kind of plot that we'll be concerned with mostly here, and uh, by the way, how many people are taking one? It, I heard some people are taking 112 simultaneously. Anybody here? Oh, well. Okay. The natural question being, why, since this is a prerequisite. But um, have you guys seen Bode plots and things like that there? Kind of. Not too much. Oh, OK. I've been actually avoiding, as Bob Dutton, right? I have, I have to avoid him because he saw me before class. He said, make, before I taught the class, he said, make sure you teach Bode plots early on. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway, so now I have to avoid him every time I see him because we didn't. Yeah. Too bad. OK, so here's a Bode plot. Yeah, I mean, you know. OK. Why are you taking 112 with 102? Just, it just worked out that way? Or? What? Oh, it's 113, sorry. Got it. OK. So just, it just worked out that way. Is it? Oh, well. OK, so here's, here's, the, here's the common plot. Uh, the common way to plot a frequency response is called a Bode plot. It's for, I guess, Heinrich W. Bode. This is, ah, this goes back to 19, uh, I don't know, 1929, something like that, whatever is that where it is. And so here's the plot. What it, it, it's very interesting. It's on a log log scale, the magnitude. In other words, the magnitude is shown on a logarithmic scale. Actually, it's in decibels, OK? So this is on, in decibels, which is a log scale. The frequency plot is, is also, the frequency axis is also logarithmic. So look down here. 
the frequency is 1 radian per second, 0 0.1, 0 0.01. And so each distance like that is actually a, a factor of 10 in frequency. Okay? Um, and the, the, there's a lot of reasons for this, um, for th this type of plot. I mean, it, it's settled as a tradition for a reason. And one of the reasons is, in fact, that very often in electronic or other systems, the time scales of, of interest vary over a wide factor. Frequency scales, which are the inverses of time scales, also vary over a wide factor. Here's an example. In acoustics and speech and, well, music, the audio range, you know, it's the range of frequencies to which a human responds, is, well, an outer bound is something like 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So in other words, when, you, when, when uh, pressure variations vary less than 20 times per second, we all perceive it as just a vibration. Okay, it's, it, we don't hear it. It's a vibration. Uh, the truth is, 20 hertz we hear is a vibration, but that's another story. I mean, people don't even really under, under, even remotely understand it as an acoustic signal until it's about 40 or 50 hertz. Um, if, if pressure variations wiggle faster than, a, than 20 kilohertz, certainly no one here can hear it. Can, but we cannot. Okay? So, but that range, if you think about it, 20 to 20. Right, so it was very important to have a logarithmic frequency scale. Actually, we'll talk about that in, in detail in a minute, about why, why, why that is. But that's one of the reasons why you would have, in other words, if you're making a telephone amplifier or a radio amplifier in 1935, you, want, you need to know what happens to 20 hertz signals, what happens to 20 kilohertz signals. Okay? By the way, that's even more important now when you have broadband communications. So you have broadband communications, and now the bandwidths are even bigger than 1,000 to 1. They're a lot bigger. So if you're making a big wideband repeater amplifier or a transponder for a satellite or something like that, it's going to have a bandwidth that's really big and the time scale, the frequency scale is going to be pretty wide. Okay, so this shows the magnitude and this shows the phase. Now this plot, the phase is actually on a linear plot here. Um, and it's actually, it, uh, although this, this will be the first time so we'll do it just once, but it's a very important to get a physical feel for what this means. Remember what it is. It's a vehicle suspension. The input is the road height, and the output is the vehicle height as a function of time. In this context, we're talking about sinusoidal steady state. And actually, I, I was joking about it once, and someone told, I was joking about what it means is, in this case, you're driving a car over a sinusoidal test track. And I was joking about it. And then this guy who actually works at Ford said, what are you laughing for? And I said, what do you mean? He said, we have one. Okay, so they, ha so they have a sinusoidal test track. And how do you set the, uh, by the way, how do you do frequency response testing in that case? What do you do? You drive over the test track. How do you set the frequency? Speed speed. Exactly, you set your speed. You set, you set your speed to 22 miles an hour and you drive over your sinusoidal test track and that sets the frequency. What happens then is the car, exactly, so you're going, it's going like this and eventually the, the car will, at first, as you first go onto the test track, something, I don't know what will happen, but it ba basically, pretty soon, the, thing will, the car will actually be going up and down in a sinusoidal fashion. And then you, look at the, you compare the amplitude of the car motion up and down to that of the test track. Okay? So that's, that's the idea. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So now let's interpret this. Let's go down to low frequencies. Let's go down to 0.1 hertz. That is, uh, no, that's 0.1 radian per second or something like that. So it says that if you're going over a sinusoid, which is very long, very long, like this, then what does the car do? You can read it off of here. It's a, it, what the car does is it, fo it just follows it. If you're going over a slow, these are almost like hills, and they, some slow hills, the car just follows it. And what that says is, if I ask you what's the amplitude and phase of the car motion compared to the ground motion, it's identical. Of course it is. The car, if I were to plot the two, they would look like this. Here's the, uh, that's the test, that's, that's the ground motion, and here's the car motion, right? Well, of course, because the time scale is very, it's, it's very slow, so the car is able to sort of track it. In fact, the, the suspension system isn't doing anything, okay? All right. Now, things in, interesting happen when you get up to one radian per second. When you go over this at one radian per second, 
This thing is above zero decimals. It's probably about plus eight dB. I forget what that is. That's a, that's a factor of, I don't know, 2.5 or something like that. What does this mean? It says if you drive this vehicle over a sinusoidal test track and, and, and the motion is now a radian per second is the frequency, what is the response of the car? Is it more or less than the response than the road? It's more. It's about a factor of two and a half times more. Okay? This is a little hint here. Does this seem like a good thing? It says basically you're running over a test track. The ground is, is going up and down four centimeters. And the, the vehicle is now going up and down 210 centimeters. Right? That's what this says. It says if, if you do this. Now, if you, if you speed up, if you put, push on the accelerator and speed up, the frequency goes up. And what happens now to the response of the vehicle? Well, this says as, as, as the frequency increases, the magnitude goes down. For example, you go 10 times higher to 10 radians per second, and the magnitude is now not minus 25 dB. Okay? That's a factor of 20 smaller. Okay? So what you would say is, out here, this is what we think of. This is, this is, this is a smooth ride. It says you're going over this thing. The wheels are bumping up and down like this. And the motion of the car is a factor of 20 smaller. This is a, this is a smoothed ride. Okay? So this is not good. And in fact, this is an underdamped system. And this is another way to understand why an underdamped system, in the time domain, you can understand it because you saw the curb response. Here you can understand it because if you're unlucky enough to hit a bunch of bumps in the road, which are spaced just at the right frequency, you're gonna, it's going to take you for a little ride. You're going to get a response, the car will respond a factor of two and a half times more. And the, I mean, what's the whole point of a suspension system? The whole point of a suspension system is to have the car respond less to bumps in the road, right? So anyway, now if I do this, if I plotted this curve with a critically damped system, it would do the right thing. It would do something like that, okay? Actually, it would be flat for a little bit, and then it would pop down, okay? And what, what, then you would, would you read this, you'd say, that wor that's a suspension system works very nicely. Up to this frequency, a description of what, the shock of what the suspension system does is very simple. As a rough summary, it's nothing, right? Because if you plotted the road deviation and the car deviation, it would look like that. Well, of course, if you're going up a hill, you don't expect the car to kind of wait and then go up a hill five minutes later or something like that. I mean, it, this makes sense, right? On the other hand, above this frequency, uh, above this frequency, the magnitude is much smaller. And so that's th what we, what, and then the rough description of what does the suspension system do above that frequency, the answer is it smooths things out. So there, for example, this might be the road height. That's a pathetic sinusoid, but you get the idea. And then the response of the vehicle would be this, right? So the wheels are bumping up and down like this, and the car is, moving, is, is running smoothly. And so this is at high frequencies. OK, so that's just an example of how you interpret one of these plots. You'll, you'll actually, there's a lot, of, be a lot of other things you'll interpret with these. But OK, there's a question. What is the physical meaning of the one radian per second frequency? What is that, some zero pole or? Uh, we're going to, actually, it's very near to a pole. We're going to get to all of that. You will understand why this looks like this soon. OK, so let's look at a log-log plot. These are, these are some obvious things, but it's, it's worth mentioning. In a, in a Bode plot, a, a vertical distance here is, is in decibels. And decibels is a factor. So for example, and of course, this is, this is basically like E40 material, E101 material. I mean, you should just know these by heart. I mean, basically, decibels are, you should know these factors. Like for example, everyone should know that 2 to 1 is about 6 decibels. 10 to 1 is 20 decibels, and so on, a factor of 0 0.01, for example, is minus 40 decibels. And these things you just need to know, period. There's just no, you shouldn't be fiddling around with these. When someone says a decibel, you should know that that's about 10%. Okay? So that when you walk in somewhere and someone says, well, I've done all my calculations for this, uh, this, this link gain on the satellite, but the signal I'm getting is minus 3 dB. And you should know what that means. It doesn't mean... It, it, should, it means it's about, you know, whatever, minus, or minus 6 dB. It's about half of what it's supposed to be, according to the calculations. Now, horizontal distance represents a fixed frequency factor. That's very interesting. And there are some fixed frequency factors you should know. 
um, and understand just because, well, they're interesting. And, and if you didn't see it in E40 or 101, I, I, I guess I'll tell you about it now because everyone should know about these. Um, first of all, I guess it's, it's becoming common in electrical engineering and mechanical engineering to refer to a frequency factor of 10 to 1 as a decade. Okay? So people refer to that as a decade in frequency. That's obvious. Okay? Um, but another interesting uh, ratio of frequency is 2 to 1, and that's an octave. So, and, and this does come directly from music. Uh, it's an octave. Now, it turns out, if you get into the real horrible details of like piano tunings and things, um, it turns out that the ratios are not exactly 2 to 1 for various esoteric reasons. Okay? And in fact, it varies depending on, the, uh, on the, the, the minor style. But to a couple of digits, it's 2 to 1 is a musical octave. Um, and as long as that's been brought up, I might as well explain that if you take uh, a twelfth on a frequency, on a logarithmic frequency scale, that's a musical half, it's a semitone, is a step. So 6% is, a, is the change in frequency, approximately, between two half tones. In fact, it's far more complicated. Um, when you actually do tunings, they're not quite this way. So, and then if you, if you actually look into this, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It turns out that all the, most of the pleasant musical intervals turn out to be shockingly close to, to, to small integers, like 3 to 2. 2 to 1 is an octave, 3 to 2 is a fifth, very close. 4 to 3 is like a major third and all that kind of stuff. So it's if you're interested. This, is, these are, these, this doesn't have anything to do with anything, by the way, but it's just fun to know. Um, OK, now the slope on a Bode plot is given in units such as decibels per octave or dB per decade. So if, you, if you're talking about decibels per decade, that's kind of the new that's kind of the new way to say it. So, but decibels per octave is kind of, that has, that, this has kind of the retro feel to it. So if you like using, uh, I don't know, if you, like, if you say DC and stuff, you should probably say decibels per octave. Okay, because it's, um, I don't know, it's got, I don't know. You'd find that written like in 1930 and stuff like that. So it's, but it's, it's got a good sound. I, I use it, well, depends. Um, okay. Now for phases, this is kind of obvious, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, phases in multiples of 360 don't matter. They don't matter, of course. In other words, if someone says, what's the phase of that? And you say 10 degrees, and you say, oh, I disagree. It's 370. It turns out you are not disagreeing. You're the same. Or someone else says, no, 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 it's minus 170. You're all talking about the same thing. So phases are the same. And then there's, there's different. What this means is that you, have, you, know, you just have to be a little careful. And this is fairly obvious. Um, let me show you an example of how this works. It's the idea of wrapping and unwrapping. When you, uh, when you plot phase, okay? Uh, you have a phase meter and you're going to do a phase experiment. The number is going to come out maybe between plus minus 180. And so you might see something that looks like this, okay? You might see something that looks like that, okay? And I think everyone here understands that the correct way to really understand a phase plot is to wrap it into a cardboard tube. That's really the correct way because that's really the way a, fa a Bode plot, right? Have we had just a little bit more graphing technology in 19... 27, then Bode phase plots would be plotted on car in tubes, on tubes, right? Um, everyone understand how this, this, how this would look if wrapped on a tube? Okay, so in fact, what people do now is this is, it, this is the way it comes back if you measure it or, or plot it with some software. Um, the, what people do is they do something called they unwrap it, okay? And to unwrap it, what you do is you take this chunk and you just, you, you shift it down by 360. Okay, then you chunk, you move this down by 360. Okay, and then you get a phase plot that is going to be on a different scale. There, I'll finish it. So it kind of goes like that, and the, this phase plot goes from like plus 180 to minus you know 500 degrees. Okay, you have to be a little bit careful about that, right? Because um, you know, what does minus 500 degrees mean? And the answer here basically is pretty much nothing. It means that we added various multiples of 360 here to the, to the phase plot to make it so our, our, so our I wasn't hurt in following the plot. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's the idea. So in fact, people have written little, 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 uh, little methods for, this is called phase unwrapping and so on. Okay, so I mention this just in case this, this comes up somewhere. But it also, it's important to understand that, that when you have a phase plot, there's many different ways in there, it's ambiguous. Okay. Here's, here's one of the reasons that, that, um, that 
Bode plots are widely used, and it has to do with what the Bode plot of a product is, and I'll, I'll even tell you fundamentally why this is mathematically. It's very. Suppose you have a product of transfer functions, okay? And so that means a signal comes in, u, it goes through a transfer function or convolution system to produce some intermediary signal, which then goes through another one. So this comes up all the time. For example, this could be an acoustic signal. G could represent the transfer function of a microphone, and this is now an electrical signal. And F represents, which is an op-amp circuit or some electrical circuit, and it, it is the transfer function of the amplifier, and this is the output of the amplifier. And so altogether, we have the transfer function from acoustic pressure to output of the amplifier. This is in newtons per meter. This is in volts. Okay? And the transfer function, of course, is the product of the two, which is great. That's much better than saying that the impulse response is the convolution of the two. Um, okay. Now, if you take the uh, frequency, if you take the, 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 bo the magnitude of the, fre of the frequency response in decibels, that's 20 log 10 of this thing, but the log of the magnitude, first of all, the magnitude of a product of two complex numbers is the product of the magnitudes, and the log is the sum, so you get this. Now, what this says, this top line says, is that on a Bode magnitude plot, when you take the product of transfer functions, their Bode plots add. It's extremely simple. They add. That's all. Okay? And of course, it makes perfect sense because the thought experiment you would do here is the following. You'd look at this and you'd say, suppose we had an acoustic tone at one kilohertz. What happens to it? It goes through the microphone. The microphone would have a gain at that frequency of, I don't know, you know, 10 to the minus 7 and then plus 10 to the minus 7 times j. I'm making it up. Okay? That would be the magnitude. And so you get an electrical signal now, which is equal to whatever this phasor was times that number. And then we go through this amplifier, and you do the same thing. And you just multiply the complex numbers. That's multiplying the complex magnitudes. And very important, it's adding phases. Right? When you multiply two complex numbers and you look at the angle or phase, it adds. Right? That's, that's back to this basic. Uh, in fact, what this really is here, of course, is this is the, the instead of looking at real and imaginary parts, you can look at complex numbers in terms of the, um, what do you call it, the angular coordinates, or what do you call that? Radi the radius and the angle. What's that called? Polar. polar. That, yes, that's the word in English, polar coordinates. Yeah. So in polar coordinates, the whole point is that in polar coordinates, complex multiplication is really easy. You multiply the radii, and you add the angles. Okay? Now, complex addition in polar coordinates is a real pain. But that's the way these things are. Okay. So here's what it really comes down to. What it really comes down to is that, in fact, there is something called the log of a complex number. And you, you might know this already. And the log of a complex number is, in fact, equal to this. It's equal to the, the real part is the log of the magnitude. And the imaginary part is just the phase. That's the log. OK? And in fact, it will satisfy e to the log z equals z. That's what it will satisfy. So what this says is that log magnitude and phase are not, they're not picked because they're, they were convenient. Well, they were picked because they were convenient things to plot and understand a, a frequency response. That's the truth is they were picked because of that. But the deeper truth is that they are intimately connected by mathematics. So log magnitude of a complex number and the phase are the real and the imaginary parts of the, lo of the complex logarithm. Okay, so they are, they are very connected. This is not an accident that these are the ways, this is how a Bode plot is. Um, so let's look at an example. Here's a Bode plot of 1 over s plus 10. And of course, you know, you should get used to, uh, well, checking things. Like, for example, the DC gain of this is 1 tenth. That's minus 20 dB. Sure enough, you don't actually see the DC gain on a Bode plot because it's a logarithmic scale. So zero frequency on a log scale is infinitely far to the left, right? But the, the idea of a Bode plot is usually you plot it to a low enough frequency where what happens to the left, this is, of course goes with any plot, what happens to the left is presumed to be boring. Right? In other words, here it's been zero decibels for two decades. And so the point is if the person was giving you a good plot, the presumption is that it stays that way. And so that's the DC gain. And it is indeed minus 20. 
Here's the, and here's the phase plot. Here's another one, 1 plus 1 over s. That looks like this. It, it's got a Bode plot that's rising for small frequencies, falls. We'll get to all of this later. Here's the phase. And if I want to now simply take the product, which is 1 plus 1 over s times 1 over s plus 10, all I do is I take these two and I add them. I add this to that, and I add this to that. And what you get is this. This thing kind of looks like this. It goes down, flat. This guy's flat, down. This guy kind of snakes down like an S, kind of a backwards S here. And this guy snakes up. And sure enough, if you add these two together, you get the Bode plot of the product, which looks like this. Snakes down, goes down, flat for a little bit, then down. Then the phase kind of goes up and then comes down. OK? And that's the, that's the idea. OK? So this is. Uh, general idea. OK. Um, let's look at, at, at Bode plots, um, relations between Bode plots and uh, poles and zeros. That's actually quite important. And I guess we'll probably end up doing a bunch of this stuff on, uh, on Friday as well. Um, so what, um, here there's some very, very important graphical ideas to understand stand them. Oh, um, I should mention, how do you get a, a Bode plot these days? This is probably a good point to say it. Well, let me explain. In 1929, 1930, uh, you would learn many, many weeks of tricks for plotting Bode plots. And in fact, they even invented this, I've even seen one once, this weird plastic curve thing. I'm not kidding. There's a little weird plastic thing. And if you were, I don't know, an electrical engineer in like 1933, you would own one of these along with your slide rule. And it would actually allow you to plot various Bode plot things. I'm not kidding. I mean, this is, OK. So how do you do it now? Well, the answer is you find the nearest computer. <clears throat> and you describe the transfer function of the computer. And the computer will then plot instantly, of course, the Bode plot perfectly. OK? So if we transported one of these people from 1933 to now and said, look at this, they would go nuts. And they would <coughs> stamp on their their plastic uh, little thing and, I don't know, throw away their slide rule. Actually, they wouldn't. The usual reaction is, is nah, nah, that's stupid. Yeah, well, it's, no, it's, it's not a challenge anymore. They don't know anything. Um, that would be the, that's actually really what they would say, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> but actually, what this means is it's actually really good for you. So actually, let me, t let me j I'll just tell you some of the, uh, I'm allowed every, every lecture to blow off two or three minutes. I think I've already done that, but anyway. Uh, OK, so here, here's, here's the deal. Let me tell you some, here's some extreme positions, OK? Extreme position number one is someone comes in. Yeah, it's even got, I think it's got some merit. But extreme position number one says, this is crap. You don't need any of this stupid stuff. We have computers now. Don't waste your time teaching them any of this crap. Stupid. Go to a computer, explain. You type Bode, Bode of transfer function, <laughs> OK? And that's that. Okay, and you, and to be honest, this approach actually has a little bit of, I mean, I secretly kind of approve of that in a way. Okay. Now, then in most cases, what's done is they're teaching the same material that they have since 1930. So they are actually, if you look in your 1100 page book on signals and systems and electrical engineering, you will find chapters on plotting Bode plots. And they'll have straight line approximations and this and all this kind of, and it's that I agree with is totally useless. It is in all the books. Do not ask me why it is in all the books, but it is still there. It's there because it's been there since 1930. And I don't know, using these things, people built things like you know, telephony <clears throat> and um, I don't know, things like that, radio, wireless. Um, so then I guess you know, who's to argue with them? They, they put a man on the moon. I don't know. OK, so um, all right. That's all nonsense, I think. Okay, so. But there is actually something really important here. What's really important is to understand the relation between like the poles and zeros and the Bode plot. That's really important. And let me tell you why it is. Because I promise all of you, especially you in 113, <clears throat> are going to be in the following situation. You will have something in front of you like an amplifier. You're going to want it to do something. And it's not doing it. And you will plot the Bode plot. And you will look at it and you'll say, now I know, of course. I mean, it doesn't mean anything to you now, but later you'll say, well, of course you can't have a big phase bump like that. Of course you can't. It's clear why it doesn't work. And your spice simulation is verifying that your amplifier sucks. Okay? 
Then the question comes, what do you change in the amplifier to make it better? Mm. Now, if you skipped out on any understanding of the Bode lecture, you don't know. You have a stupid computer which will happily and instantaneously plot a Bode plot for you. Okay? But it will not tell you what to change in the amplifier to make the Bode plot do what you want it to do. Okay? So that's why, if you, that, that's why what's important is if you understand the relationship between the poles and zeros and the Bode plot, then you'll say, oh, okay, I know what to do. I'm going to make this, I'm going to take the bias current for this transistor and I'm going to make it larger. And what that's going to do is that's going to do this, and this pole is going to move that way. And then this big old phase bump is going to get smaller, and my amplifier will start working. Okay, so, okay. That's, remember, I'm allowed to do that once per lecture. Okay, so, that's, so the nice part is you don't have to be tortured with all these ridiculous things about plotting uh, Bode plots by hand, right? right? Which is not unlike, you know, dealing with second order response by hand, right? It's, uh, except, you know, on those rare occasions when you are stranded on a desert island without a computer, but for some reason need to do some high-tech engineering. <laughs> uh, so in situations like that, then, of course, you know, you need to know these details and things like that. You know. um, and that happens, you know, more often than you'd imagine. <laughs> okay, so Bode plots are factored form. If you write the transfer function out in, in uh, factored form, so here's the zeros, here's the poles, and here's this gain. It, notice that it's a product. And because it's a product, the Bode plot is unbelievably easy to understand. It is simply, it's a sum of each term. Each term contributes a little chunk of the Bode plot. That's what happens. And in fact, that's the right way to understand it. Every zero, every pole, this gain, we're going to analyze each one. So the magnitude of the gain, for example, is equal to, it's the, it's the log mag absolute value of k, log of each of these terms, that's these, they add. These subtract because they're in the denominator. That's what it means when you take a log. It's a minus sign. Okay? So what this says is, if you get a good picture for what a Bode plot looks like for a single zero and a Bode plot for a single pole, you're actually in excellent shape because you can build up the Bode plot of this then from, by adding poles and zeros. Very cool. This is very cool because now you can do something which is synthesis. And someone can say to you, I want the Bode plot to look like this. What do you do? And then you can say, oh, ooh, that's tough. But I have an idea. I'm going to add another zero, and I'm going to add another pole. And here's where they're going to be. And if you understand these things, the new Bode plot, which of course will be instantaneous and totally accurate, it will be just what you want it to be if you got the idea. And you might tweak it a little bit. You say, well, look, my zero's a little bit too low frequency. I'll bump the frequency up and all that. OK, same with the phase. It just adds up. Um, 20, oh dear. Mm. Sorry. A little bit of copying residue there. All right, there you go. OK, so let's look at this. A very important, uh, so this is sort of an algebraic understanding. And this is very important. It says that you can understand the Bode plot of any rational transfer function simply by understanding the Bode plot of a zero or a pole. And in fact, guess what? Zeros and poles are the same things. They're upside down. Because the only difference between this and this is that there's a minus sign here. And the only difference between this and this is there's a minus sign here. So the truth is, you need to understand the Bode plot of one thing, just about. And then you can reconstruct what the Bode plot is of anything rational. So let's look at a rational, uh, at, a, at a graphical interpretation. We'll quit uh, after that. And then um, we'll go into this in great detail on, on Friday. So here's graphical interpretation. And what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to graphically interpret is this, that the magnitude of the transfer function, I'm going magni to do this. The magnitude of the transfer function is this. Plug in j omega everywhere, like so, and put magnitude here. Magnitude's everywhere. So the magnitude of the transfer function at, at a given frequency is the product of the absolute values of these guys, the zeros, and then the poles. But let's look at those graphically. Oh, here it is. I wrote it down here. Um, if you have two complex numbers, u and v, right? Here's u, here's v in the complex plane. u minus v is a vector, is the complex number that points like that, right? And the, ab the complex absolute value of u minus v is the distance in the complex plane between u and v, right? It's the square by, you know, what Pythagore Pythagorean theorem or something. It's the sum of the squares of the real parts. Uh, it's the square root of, this, of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. 
Okay? So whenever you see absolute value u minus v, and these are complex numbers, that's the distance between u and v in the complex plane. Okay? This says that the magnitude of the frequency response at j omega is the product of the distances from j omega to zi divided by the distances from j omega to pi. And here's the picture, extremely important picture. Poles and zeros are shown. Pick your favorite frequency, s equals j omega, like here, I've picked s equals j omega. It says that the magnitude of that transfer function is the following. It is the product of the distances to the zeros. So there's only one zero, so it's that, it's that distance. Divided by the following. The product of the distances to the poles. That's this length times that times that. Everybody got that? So when you understand that, you will be able to immediately understand a lot of things qualitatively. For example, if I take my frequency up here, then the, the frequency response is this distance, which is growing, right? but divided by the product of that, that, and that, all of which are increasing. As I move the frequency higher and higher, what happens to the transfer function in this case? Does it go up? Does it go down? What happens? In fact, let's even be more specific about it. Suppose the frequency is way, way high up here. So looking down on all these poles and zeros, they all kind of look like they're at the origin. You're way, way, way up here. And suppose I go from that frequency, I double the frequency. I want to know what's going to happen to the transfer function. What will happen? If, I, if, I, if, you, if you go from here to a place twice as far, what will the distance to this zero do? It'll go from here to here. If you, if you double your frequency along that axis, what will happen to the, to the distance to the zero? Will it double exactly? No. But it's if, if the first frequency is pretty high, it, it will come close to doubling. And we're doing approximations here, so we're going to say it's going to approximately double. Okay? How about the distance to all the poles? They'll approximately double. Okay? What's the net effect then? What? Okay, let's be very careful. There's one guy in the numerator, and he doubles. There's three guys in the denominator, that's the three poles, and they all double. What's the net effect? One fourth. It's one fourth. It's one fourth. That's it. Okay? So it's one fourth, and that's exactly right. We'll get that. Here's another one. If you see a pole, and in fact, I'm going to answer a question that was asked earlier today. Okay? Here is the pole zero diagram of the uh, car suspension system. It's right there. That's it. Okay? That's, that is it. Underdamped. This is the underdamped case. Okay? Now someone asked a question, what does that bump mean? Why is it that at one radian per second, the response of that car is substantially more than the, than the road height? Well, this is going to be one radian per second. Let's use this rule. What you do is you put a little bead on this axis, and you draw the distances, and you try to figure out what's going on. Okay? If you're way, way up here, the distances are all, I mean, these are all about the same. You have one zero, and so you're actually, you can actually see that you're falling off kind of like inversely with frequency. What happens when you're right about here? Well, the distance to the zero is something. The distance to this pole is, well, it's something. What's the distance to this pole, though? It's really small. And the distance to the pole appears in the denominator. And when you have something really small in the denominator, what happens to the number? It's big. So you can almost visualize it, and in fact, uh, it's, I, that's what I do. I like to visualize you know, putting a bead here, drawing these lines to it, and just pulling the bead along the axis. And you will, you will visualize it. When you go right by a pole, if you go right by a pole, what is the frequency response going to do? It's going to have a big blip, right? Because right as you pass by it, you're going to be really close. And that's in the denominator. What happens if you pass by, what if, what if we had that? What happens now? What does that do? What will this do to the frequency response? Hmm? Exactly. You go right near a pole, and it will be, so if this were two radians per second, what would happen in the Bode plot is exactly this. Uh, here's one, here's two. At one, you might, you'd have a peak, okay? And when you get near two, you dip like that, okay? So this is called a notch, for example, okay? And it's what happens when you get near a pole, okay? 
So that's the basic geometric idea. And you can also go back and look at the phase, which is also really interesting. Let's figure out one more thing on the phase of this suspension system. And then we're going to quit, even though we're over time. I don't care. Here's your suspension system. Okay. Let's do the phase angle. Phase angle goes like this. You take a bead, and you draw the vectors from all the poles and zeros to here. And you, and you add the angles and the denominators, and you subtract the angles, uh, sorry, the angles of the zeros, and you subtract these angles. Now, imagine our bead traveling from 0.8 to 1.2 radians per second. That's this little segment of the j omega axis. Okay? How much does the angle to this pole change? Not much. How much does the angle to this pole change? More, but not a whole lot. Okay. Now, how about the angle to this pole? What happens as you sweep by a pole close? The angle to this pole changes a lot. It changes basically from like minus 45 degrees to plus 45 degrees. And it over so what we see is in a very short frequency range, you have a rapid change in phase. And now, the moment of truth, we go back. It better do this, actually, or I'm in trouble. So we have to find that. Uh-oh. Anybody see it anywhere? Uh, I lost it. If I just find it, and it's, uh, if I find it and we can verify it, then we can all go. Here it is. I found it. Good, it's true. Otherwise, I was going to have to make up an excuse. Um, look at the phase. Look at that. This is exactly what we predicted from the graphical interpretation. What's happening here is you're going by the pole, your magnitude rises. Also, as you go by a pole, what happens is you have a radical change in phase. It's right here. Look at this. There it is. Okay. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll continue this idea next time, but let's make you get the picture. <laughs>